about my first uh, experience of uh, the word called ahimsa is from childhood because people growing up in the early 60s just can't escape hearing this word either at home or in the society in the social structure or in the schools because there is a high noon of our indian republic when jawaharlal nehru was still alive gandhi was a kind of an icon almost every every kind of a discourse and of course there were so many multiple understandings of the gandhian spirit and ahimsa was always in there so that's nothing i can't just say that i was surprised by the word ahimsa it was something which was like the oxygen for all of us we always thought sure. that ahimsa was a very positive thing that one has to be by default a human being is uh, uh, non violent and you got really was hard to become violent so but later when we started reading uh, you know philosophy and other things uh, we started understanding that it's not that simple it's a very complex word but i have my own unorthodox understanding of ahimsa that is uh, i think it's a double negation because ahimsa itself is a negation of existence so you negate uh, negation you become a double negation so it's a very dialectical concept what is the significance of that ah uh, the main significance is that it can never be brought down to an absolute position you have to take uh, non violence uh, in a very relativistic very practical kind of a view point this is gandhi i think understood it very very fundamentally that's why he always used to say that uh, ahimsa is not for the coward it's for the brave which is very 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 difficult statement to understand actually it's very easy to say that uh, majboori ka naam mahatma gandhi which is actually one of the most uh, travesty of the concept of ahimsa guru is actually a very enigmatic personality for the modern historian because uh, he can be anything which you want him to be for the advaitin he is a advaita advaita practitioner of the most sophisticated variety for the uh, left liberal crowd he is a social reformer his philosophy is just a footnote to his social reforming process and uh, for the poet he is a absolutely brilliant poet who wrote not in one language or two languages but in three languages so he can be a very kind of uh, complex personality to define but about guru's understanding of ahimsa on a surface level i can say that he was uh, a big promoter of ahimsa in fact he has written uh, poems uh, working against uh, any kind of uh, killing including killing for food fundamentally he was a man who was who said that violence to any any any, any organic being including plants and hills and rocks and anything is basically a violence against oneself one's own self because he was a person who believed in the uh, overpowering pervading uh, entity called the self actually guru never never knew that he was fighting a battle because he was not a man who was interested in creating barricades on the other hand he was equally sympathetic towards both the oppressed and the oppressor he thought the oppressor is as much uh, the suffering part of the suffering system as the oppressed oppressed is so people used to ask him that when people come and for such a great saint like you you are being treated like a like a like an untouchable or something how do you how do you react to that someone asked him so he said i feel pity for them they don't know the whole scriptures and on which they are basing their arguments they all look at the whole human uh, human being as one single whole there is absolutely no difference between one human from the other there is no othering of the human every human is part of one whole self so i feel pity for them i never feel any kind of anger or uh, anger or um, you know resentment towards them so you can see from the guru's point of view he was not doing any battle he was only opening up the kind of a morass the crust which had which had deposit which had been depositing over centuries over the society and he sort of unraveled the truth to everyone both the oppressor and the oppressed it so happened that the 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 the, the the benefits were visible for the people who were at the bottom of the pyramid but the benefits were there for the people who were oppressing too they also got liberated because they became part of a more democratic more uh, uh, you know equitable and a more fraternal society for him uh, he's he i think he intuitively felt probably it's my understanding that one kind of oppression can always be taken over by another kind of oppression unless individual soul gets purified of all its morasses and all encrustments 
and the important thing is for the people to stop othering other human beings for him the othering concept was very important because he had used it in most of his philosophical poems that the other is the self the self is the other is he went on reiterating this in most of his uh, uh, lifetime so for him uh, decolonization decolonization is not a project at all so i don't believe that uh, backwaters collective has got any interest in decolonization itself because for us the the colonialize the decolonized mind itself is part of a new colonial colonial setup for everyone non violence is the only one which will keep the society intact even the most violent person uh, who uh, practices you stay goes out on the street and say jalao unko maro goli maar do salon ko and all they say but he wants his family his community to be safe his primary instinct is to have a safe comfortable congenial society it is his wrong misperception It's misperception that by killing others you become safe which he himself in the deep depth of his heart he knows that is why when they come on uh, civilized uh, conferences they will all talk the right things you know they will talk about how one has to be nice to each other and other things so this is basically that in the heart of heart everyone knows that being one on violence is the default condition of existence coexistence most of the upanishads are written by people who had passed through some crisis in their life after passing through a crisis or some tough questions or some inner kind of burning they come and write upanishad so if you don't have a crisis you don't have a knowledge that's that's what our indic methodology is it's not only really indic all over the world is like that most of the great writings have come out of deep anguish and deep pain so i have a feeling that even this process will bring out its own kind of you know nectar on violence is as primal to existence for a society as oxygen is for the human or the animal existence organic existence So I don't even believe in this coinage of possibilities. It's not possibilities. It's recovering. It's actually removing the toxicity, enveloping uh, nonviolence.